Good evening, and this is Pastor Craig coming, at, coming to you from Brant Naz, and we are here again with our Bible study. Glad you could uh, join us, whether it's live or if you're watching it later, welcome, and uh, we're glad you're here, and we hope you are blessed by this study that we are doing. Uh, this evening, we're continuing our, our study in the long road of holiness. We're looking at holiness. We're looking at scripture that uh, speaks about holiness and what it is. We're also looking at it through the, through the uh, lens and through the book of uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. Um, I talked a bit about it last week. I will um, do a bit of a synopsis of what we talked about last week. But first I want to address, we did have one question right as we were uh, ending last week. And I want to get that. But before we do that, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we come to you this evening and we just thank you that we're able to come here and just... Uh, study your word, to look into what we need to know, how we can follow you, and just um, what we can do to be the uh, best followers that we can be. Father, uh, we love you, and we just pray this in your name. Amen. As we also go on, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. If uh, we don't have time for to answer them tonight, uh, we'll get to them next week. If you do it uh, soon enough and not right at the end, we might be able to answer a few at the end, before the end of the study. But um, right at the end of last week, we had one come through and I just wanted to answer that. So the question was, where does faith come in? In the, in the holiness, the long road of holiness when we are going through life, we become Christians and, and we're moving forward. And where does faith come in? And the answer to that is, faith comes in every step. Faith comes, um, we're saved by faith, we live by faith, we believe in, through faith, and we just, everything in our life depends on our faith and following Jesus. If we, if we look at uh, Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter, it talks about all of the ancients and how they, they followed their faith and how they were made um, righteous by their faith and how their faith helped them follow God the whole, the whole way. Now, I'm not going to read the whole chapter, um, but it starts with, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So faith comes at every step because in every step we're moving forward. Every step we are being certain of what we, don't, what we hope for, but what we cannot see. We are putting our faith there are many different things we can put our faith in. We can put our faith in ourselves. We can put our faith in another person. We can put our faith in just about anything. I'm putting my faith in this chair right here that is going to hold me up. So far, my faith has been rewarded. But someday, even this chair will break down and I'll fall. But our faith in Christ will never fail. And we are saved through that faith. We live through that faith. And we believe through faith, and we can also be said that we are protected by faith. And we'll get into that a bit later when we talk about the, uh, the, armor, the armor of God, the shield of faith. So I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, go ahead and, uh, and further ask a question if, if there's anything more. But where does faith come in? Faith comes in every single step, every th single breath that we take is in faith. So let's continue. I want to just, for those of you who uh, might not have been here last week or maybe forgot over the past week, uh, I just want to do a quick synopsis. So we're talking about holiness. And what is holiness? Well, holiness is being set apart. It's being set apart for a religious purpose. So we're setting ourselves apart. We've decided to follow Christ, to set ourselves apart from the world, to set ourselves apart from the sin and, and the th things of the world and follow Christ. Um, a holy life is love. It's love in our, in our core being. It's where we get to a point where we love God. We love God more than anything. And we want to follow God. And we want to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. We want to just do what God asks us to do. Uh, we likened it, or I likened it to a um, cartoon where you have an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, and they're both trying to get you to 
do what they want you to do. And it's having that love to where you're listening to the angel because you want to do what God tells you. Now, that's an imperfect thing. I mean, that's um, a very, very simplified version of it, but it's following the leading of Christ in everything that we do and our love for God and our love for others as well. And it's um, holiness and the life of believers is most clearly understood as Christ-likeness. It's us being like Christ. Uh, holiness isn't optional. We looked at that. We're to be holy because God is holy. That's uh, stated in Leviticus with Moses <coughs> and God telling Moses to be holy because he is holy. And it's reiterated in Peter, 1 Peter, where uh, Peter says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And we looked at the holy life as a journey. It's a journey. Once we start and we believe, and it's moving forward, and just going through life, and uh, doing the different things that we need to do in life. And we uh, started talking about the Pilgrim's Progress a little bit as well and how it's a book about the, a journey of a man named Christian who um, starts out with a burden, gets the burden off, and then it's about his journey. We're not going to go a whole lot into it. It's a um, small book, but there's a lot in it. We're going to talk about a few different things from it tonight again, just so we can uh, kind of get an idea and solidify in our minds maybe what the different things are about. The... Um, the burden that Christian has, he's got something heavy on his back, and it's, it's sin. He has a sin. He realizes he has a sin, and the first part of the book is him trying to figure out how to get rid of, get rid of that sin. Just like Christians, when we come to that crisis moment, we come to that moment where we realize that we need to get rid of our sin, and how do we do it? And we do that through Jesus on the cross. Christian gets to the cross and he prays, you know, take it away, and it rolls, the, his burden falls off his back and rolls down into a, a grave, and it's never seen again. There's a cost to following Christ. Um, there's, uh, you know, throughout Scripture, it tells us, you know, it's going to be hard, it can be tough. You know, the world is against us. Um, not the whole world, but the whole, you know, we're, we're going to have problems in our life. We're going to have issues in our life because of following Christ. And uh, there's a cost to following, to following him. Now that's um, about where we ended last week. And I just want to uh, give a quick, um, quick commercial. I was looking online for uh, Pilgrim's Progress movies or videos that you could watch. And I found a good one on, on YouTube. And it's Rogue Valley Fellowship, and it's called The Pilgrim's Progress Full Feature Film. It was made by a church in Medford, Oregon. I lived in Medford for a few years, but it has nothing to do with it. But um, it's a church there. They made it on $2,500. It's a very good production. It's, um, it's great. I was watching it, and um, it hits all the, the good points. And from the, It doesn't have everything in the book, of course. But it hits all the, the main points of the book. So if you want to watch a movie that's uh, very well done, um, you can watch that. Once again, you can type in Rogue Valley Fellowship or The Pilgrim's Progress Full Feature Film. And uh, you can watch that. And if, you, if you're not a book reader but you're a movie watcher, you can watch that and uh, get an idea of what The Pilgrim's Progress is about. And also see our life of holiness in that. So the next thing I wanted to look at is that God provides protection. Let me go through the things again. First is holiness is not optional. Second is the bur our burden equals sin. There's a cost to following a holy life, but God provides protection. God gives us protection in the fight. Now, if you're following with the Bible and you wanna, you wanna follow along, I'm gonna be reading from Ephesians 6. 10 through 18, and it's uh, the armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can <coughs> extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. I like how that ends with prayer. You have all this other stuff, but always pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayer. So we have protection. Now it's not physical protection. It's not a, a real helmet and a, a real uh, breastplate. If we did get those, it might be easier to tell who other Christians are, but we don't get the physical things. So I just want you to, to think about something and I'll, I'll go through them again. As we go through the different parts of the armor of God, what is the only part of the body that's not protected? So we have the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of righteousness. We have the feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. <coughs> we have a shield of faith. We have the helmet of salvation. And we have a sword of the spirit. Now, what is the only part of the body in that that's not protected? putting the people here on the spot because I can't hear what you're saying. So anyone? Your back, your back is not protected. Your head's protected. Your feet are protected. Your front is protected. Um, your, your um, head is protected. You have your sword for protection, but your back isn't protected. Now, why is that? Why is everything protected but your back? Because you're to move forward. You're not to turn and run. If you, we have the spirit, we have the armor of God, <coughs> we're to forge on. We're to move forward. We're to uh, keep moving forward in our lives. We looked at Luke 9, 62, which says, if you put your hand to the plow and turn around, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. That's the same thing. If you turn around to do something else while you're supposed to be fighting, you leave your back exposed, and that's, that's a problem. So um, those, that's the protection. We could uh, do a whole Bible study, and someday maybe we will, but you could do a whole Bible study on the armor of God. But just for, for this study... It's important to remember that we are going to have tough times. We are going to be attacked. We are, um, there is a cost to it, but we do have the armor of God. And hold on to that thought for a second, because when we get to number six, that uh, combined, comes back with, with this one. But the next part is we have this armor, <coughs> and then we know that we will be attacked. Now this is closely related to there is a cost, but we will be attacked, we know that. There is a cost to following Christ. And I think most of us may have, you know, had spiritual attacks in our walk, spiritual attacks in our lives, spiritual attacks in, in what, we, what we do in our, in our lives. So those will come. I wanna read just something from, from the Pilgrim's Progress, and this is after after Christian has, he's, you know, he knows he has a burden, he needs to get rid of it, he's gone to the cross, he's gotten rid of, of the, uh, his burden has fallen off and rolling down into the, into the grave and it's to be seen no more. He travels a bit more, he has some problems, you know, he goes backwards and realizes he's done wrong and people come along and, you know, tell him what he's done wrong and what his, what he should be doing. And he moves forward again. And he gets to one spot and he's given the armor of God. And he moves forward. And he comes to a spot, a place where 
he's going to be attacked by Apollyon, who, which is another name for, for Satan. So uh, I just want to read a quick thing. Now, Christian is now going down into a place called the Valley of Humiliation. And it says, but now in this Valley of Humiliation, poor Christian was hard put to it. For he had gone but a little way before he espied a foul fiend coming over the field to meet him. His name is Apollyon. Then did Christian begin to be afraid and to cast in his mind whether to go back or to stand firm his ground. But he considered again that he had no armor for his back and therefore thought that to turn back to him might give him greater advantage with ease to pierce him with his darts. Therefore he resolved to venture and stand his ground. For thought he, had I no more in mine eye than, to, than the saving of my life, t'would be the best way to stand." So he went on and Apollyon met him. And they fight and they go for a few pages of, of talking back and forth and fighting and, and uh, just um, battling. And eventually Apollyon starts to get the best of Christian. And Christian, um, like I said, they're fighting. And then it says, then Apollyon, espying this, his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian and wrestling with him, gave him a dreadful fall. And with that, Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then said Apollyon, I am sure of thee now. And with that, he had said, Sorry, And with that, he had almost pressed him to death, so that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching of his last blow thereby to make a full end of this good man, Christian nimbly reached out for his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And with that, he gave a deadly thrust, which made him give back as one that had received his mortal wound. Christian, perceiving that, made at him, saying again, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped him away, that Christian saw him no more. Christian stood his ground. He didn't run because he realized there's no protection on his back. If all he wanted to do was <coughs> survive physically, then turning around and running may have been all right. But spiritually, he needed to move forward, and he did, and he had issues. He was attacked. He, there was a cost for his following, but he was able to conquer the foe in, in what he was doing. So you will be attacked. Now, closely related, the next, uh, number six, we, number four is we, God gives protection, and number six is we will have help. We're not just thrown to the wolves. We're not just pushed out there and said, you know, go tell, go do the Great Commission, but you're on your own. We have something very powerful, more powerful than the armor of God, and that is the Holy Spirit. We were given, the church was given the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and I'm going to read a few verses regarding the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, I think, gets uh, kind of a short, the short end of the stick in the Trinity. We, uh, we know, we've, know who the Holy Spirit is and uh, the name, but I think um, the Trinity, and this is a whole other Bible study on its own, but you know, it's three in one. It's three distinct people, for lack of a better word, in one, one in three. So there's God the Father, who people can relate to because of the Father aspect. There's Jesus, who is easy to relate to because of what he did, dying and, and saving us from our sins. And then there's the Spirit, who does a lot. He does a lot of things. We're going to look at that right now. <coughs> this Sunday, I'm going to do a plug for the sermon real quick, but this Sunday we're also going to be looking at the Spirit and uh, going deeper into what the Spirit does and uh, how the Spirit helps us. But Acts 1.8, this is Pentecost. Um, sorry, no, this is the, when Jesus comes back and he's talking to them and Jesus promises, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Hebrews 2.4 says, God also testified to it by signs, 
wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Hebrews 13, 6. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I am not afraid. What can man do to me? And in this instance, the, the helper is the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And the comforter here is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. The Holy Spirit creates fellowship. The Holy Spirit inspires love, more than love, but sacrificial love. The Holy Spirit imparts humility, and he endues believers with spiritual gifts. Our spiritual gifts, as they are mentioned, come from the Spirit, and it's given to uh, each Christian to do with, <coughs> to help out the church, to help out other believers. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do in our lives? Well, if we looked at Romans, if you turn to Romans with me, Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 11. Eight, Romans 8, 9 through 11 says, You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but are in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even your body is subject to death because of sin. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. The Spirit gives us lies. We have two natures. We have the sinful nature and we have the spiritual nature. Sin leads to destruction and death, but the Spirit leads to life. The Spirit gives us life. The next is, through all of this, if we go back to Christian and the Pilgrim's Progress, he started out, he was a, a sinner. He had a burden on his back. He left his family to go out and to seek. He met a, an evangelist who taught, taught him. He went on and got into some uh, misadventures. And eventually he came up to Calvary Hill where the cross was. As I mentioned a couple times, his burden fell off and it was seen no more. And then he had an adventure. He went through, he goes through uh, many different adventures. He meets people who teach him. He meets people who try and get him to go back. He meets people who try and get him to go off the path the wrong direction. And through all of this, he perseveres. He has some setbacks, but he, he perseveres. He meets a friend named Faithful. He gets to a town called Vanity Fair. And in Vanity Fair, he and Faithful preach the gospel, but... The people don't want to hear it. They're arrested, thrown in jail. Um, spoiler alert, Faithful's killed. Sorry, I did that quick, but Faithful is killed. And Christian gets away. Christian gets away. He's able to uh, escape without his friend. Uh, and he, he moves forward. And he goes through and meets, again, meets more people. Things, you know, happen to him. He causes things to happen. And eventually he gets to where he can see his destination. His destination is the celestial city. His destination is heaven. And it describes heaven, and it describes what's going on. And right as they get to heaven, just to show how, you know, doubts can creep in no matter where you are, how any time in our life we might start having doubts and we might start... Um, questioning things, even as they get to heaven and they can see it, there's another 
a bog. It's, it's called the Slua de Spond. It's a, a river. And at the beginning of the book, there's one. And when they get here, there's just a river. And they're crossing it. And Christian starts doubting. And he starts sinking. <coughs> and his friend is like, come on, we're almost there. We're just there. You can see it right there. And th through some conversation, they're able to, uh, Christian is able to, uh, like Peter, rise up in the water and they make it safely across. And there's a gate on the other side and they get to the gate and this is how it, uh, it explains it. It says, now when they were come up to the gate, there was written over it in the letters of gold, blessed are they that do his commandments that they, may not, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Then I saw in my dream that the shining men bid them call at the gate and the, the which when they did, some from above looked over the gate to wit, Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, etc., to whom it was said, these pilgrims are come from the city of destruction for the love that they bear to the kingdom, to the king of this place. And then the pilgrims gave in unto each man this certificate, which they had received in the beginning. Those therefore were carried into the king, who, when he had read them, said, We are the, where are the men? To whom it was answered, They are standing without the gate. The king then commanded to open the gate, that the righteous nation, said he, that keepeth truth may enter in. Now I saw in my dream that these two men went in at the gate, and lo, as they entered, they were transfigured, and they had raiment put on them that shone like gold. There was also that met them with harps and crowns and gave them to them, the harp with praise withal, and the crowns of token of honor. Then I heard in my dream all the bells of the city rang again for joy, and, it, and that it was said unto them, Enter ye into, jo into the joy of your Lord. I also heard them in themselves, and they sang with a loud voice, saying, Blessing, honor, glory, and power be to him that sitteth upon the throne, and to the Lamb forever and ever. I'm going to add amen to that. They got to their destination. Now, they didn't just get rid of their burden. They didn't just sit down at the cross and just wait for something to happen, wait for the, for the celestial city to come to them. They had to keep going. They had to live their life of holiness, which is what we're called to do. We're called to live our life. We're called to go out into the world. We're called to make disciples. We're called to teach and to keep teaching and to send those and those people are to go out and it's we are called to fulfill the great commission now as we in this evening i just uh want to thank you for joining us for the uh, past two weeks it's um hopefully been a, a great study um are there any have there been any questions no questions yet, so if you have any questions, we have a few more minutes. If you have any questions, uh, type them in. Or during the week, or during the week true. Sorry, yeah, if, uh, if you're watching this after the, the live event, um, you can uh, type them in and we will get to them next week. So um, please do, any questions, please uh, just, just let us know. And as we continue in our lives, as we go out tonight, as you go out tomorrow, just, just remember these things, that we do have protection. We have the Spirit. And as I said, the Spirit on the conversation is, is much bigger than I could get into here. But please join us on, uh, on Sunday or after that, um, uh, preaching the sermon on um, the Holy Spirit on Sunday. If you want to know more, please watch that. You watch it live or watch it afterwards. And uh, again, if you have any questions, um, type it on there. And uh, I, can't, I can't answer it during the service, but after the service, I would be more than happy to uh, try and answer any questions that might, might come in. So I just thank you for joining us. I'm hoping that uh, I did a good plug for the Pilgrim's Progress. Please, if you, if you like to read, um, pick this up. If you don't like to read, like I said, you can watch it on YouTube. There's a diff few different versions of it on YouTube, so... Pick the one you like. There's a cartoon. There's the live action one I was talking about. 
but you can um, definitely, definitely learn. Now, this one is Old English. I'm sure you could tell by the way I was um, reading and the, kind of stuttering over a couple words. They, uh, this version is the original one, so it's kind of Shakespearean in its, in its language. But uh, there are, you can get the modern English, you can get the you know, modern versions of it, you can find comic books of it. However you read it, uh, just pick it up and read it. It's a great book, I can't say that. And even more so, if you haven't picked this up lately, not mine, but yours, if you haven't picked this up lately, pick it up and read. It's a great read. And uh, just, uh, it's been great to, to do this. We will be back next week. And uh, we'll just close in prayer. And then we will uh, go ahead and close up. And I will see you later. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we just come to you right now. And I just thank you that uh, we could come again before you. We could learn about what you would have us to learn. And tonight, just about your holiness, the being set apart from the world and set apart to you so that we may show others and tell others the life-changing and the life-saving that Jesus Christ does and the comfort and the guidance that the Holy Spirit gives. Lord, as we close tonight, I just pray for everyone who sees this. Just pray for them. Give them guidance. Help them in their daily lives. And just show them the way that they need to go and what they need to do. Father God, we love you. We just pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Once again, thanks for joining and we will see you later. Bye.